Should we hate hate speech regulation? The argument from viewpoint discrimination 1. Sebastian Bishop, The Philosophical Quarterly, published the 25th of July, 2024. Abstract. According to philosophers like James Weinstein, our democratic values give us a compelling reason to tolerate hate speech. In fact, they argue that even if hate speech causes significant harms, our democratic values nonetheless sometimes call for a hands-off approach. In particular, they evoke the democratic value of citizens being free to criticize and voice dissent towards the laws that bind them. This paper seeks to establish two key points. First, that upon closer examination, the kind of arguments that Weinstein presents against hate speech regulation is less than convincing. Secondly, that by building on Weinstein's discussion of the concept of viewpoint discrimination, we can construct a more convincing objection to hate speech regulation. That said, this more convincing objection falls short of calling for the abolition of all hate speech regulation, instead highlighting the need for transparency and consistency in the way governments regulate harmful speech, hate speech, democracy, viewpoint discrimination, James Weinstein. According to one kind of definition, hate speech involves vilifying and promoting hostility towards a vulnerable social group, too often this is achieved through hate speakers painting the targeted social group as dangerous or disgusting. Hate speech can come in more or less subtle forms. Some hate speakers will upright paint certain racial groups as having less moral worth or possessing a moral status more akin to animals than to humans. Other times hate speech takes a more insidious form, with hate speakers using decontextualized crime statistics to try and paint a whole social group as dangerous we would do well to take the threat of hate speech seriously. Hate speech today can set the stage for very real violence tomorrow. A good deal of social scientific study speaks to the idea that not only does vilification provide humans with reasons to hurt others, but humans also find it easier to hurt those who have been vilified and dehumanized. Jonathan Glover, for instance, suggests that human beings are able to more easily engage in horrifying behavior if at the same time they expressively deny the humanity of their victims. He finds that symbolic denials of dignity, including the use of dehumanizing language, help to psychologically remove barriers to engaging in torture and inhuman treatment glove 1999. Similarly, Rich Tourette al. find that indoctrination and the acceptance of hateful ideologies, achieved through exposure to hate speech, are upstream drivers of genocidal violence. Rich Tourette al. 2018, Kuiper et al. studied the effect of hate speech on the way listeners consider our group members. They found that dehumanizing language leads to a decrease in empathy for members of the out group, and in many cases to an increased support for violence against that group. Kuiper et al. 2019, Sorrell et al. agree that hate speech increases out group prejudice. They also suggest that exposure to hate speech can have the effect of desensitizing agents to further and more serious acts of abuse. Sorrell et al. 2018. None of this is to imply that hate speech is so powerful as to necessarily lead to violence all by itself. Clearly, hate speech is just one part of a much more complicated story about how humans can come to see other humans as acceptable targets of violence. And perhaps hate speech cannot move listeners to act in harmful ways, unless a host of other conditions are already met. Still, this needn't imply that hate speech does not have a significant role to play in the violence that it is associated with. Discussing the way people are radicalized into supporting violence, Jonathan Maynard and Susan Benish write, many parts of such radicalizing journeys are not principally ideological. Existing policies are replaced by successively more extreme and provocative options. Low-level violence psychologically habituates perpetrators for more extensive campaigns. Complex bureaucratic arrangements develop progressively and expand a group's capacity to organize violence on a mass scale, and so forth. But changes in speech, and the changes in ideologies they reflect and cause, are part of the radicalizing trajectory. In the months or years preceding mass intergroup violence, relevant groups of perpetrators and their supporters come increasingly to see violence as permissible and even necessary. Repertoires of ideas and arguments that encourage such a perception become increasingly formulated and disseminated through speech, spoken, written or otherwise, allowing greater numbers of potential perpetrators to see violence as increasingly thinkable, 
possible, and justified, and to possess the justificatory resources necessary to convince others. Maynard and Benish 2016. Finally on the issue of the harmfulness of hate speech. Note that so far we have focused on how hate speech can be a precursor for harmful actions later down the line, because of the way hate speech stigmatizes and vilifies certain groups. All the same, we have a good reason to think being stigmatized and vilified for no good reason is itself a harm, too. In some ways this is an uncontroversial point. After all, defamation laws have long since assumed that people can be harmed by having their reputation damaged implicitly acknowledging that we might be harmed by how others perceive us. Moreover, a common strand found throughout many political and philosophical accounts, most notably relational accounts of autonomy, as well as accounts of dignity, respect, and humiliation, is that we are in some deep way sensitive to how others think about us. Three indeed, several philosophers have problematized hate speech precisely on these grounds. Catherine Gelber and Luke McNamara, for instance, have suggested that promulgating negative stereotypes about certain groups may itself count as harmful. Gelber and McNamara 2016, Jeremy Waldron, in at least certain moods, is concerned with the harm of having one's basic reputation as a member of society in good standing, undermined by hate speech, Waldron 2012, while Bick Huberek argues that protection of one's good name and honor are central to the good life, but sees these goods as potentially undermined by the hatred of others. Correct 2006, according to at least one line of argument, a review of the harms produced by hate speech justifies the government engaging in hate speech regulation. On this line of argument, the alleged good that hate speech regulation would do, say, in the form of harm prevention, outweighs whatever negatives are associated with hate speech regulation. So, for instance, one might think that hate speech regulation does come with certain negatives in terms of chilling speech, or sometimes resulting in governments incorrectly penalizing citizens, but hold that the positives, for example the harms prevented, outweigh the negatives. As such, hate speech laws are justified on a kind of cost-benefit calculation. This kind of reasoning is essentially consequentialist, so let's call this kind of argument in favor of hate speech regulation consequentialist. Consequentialist is probably the predominant line of argument currently used to defend hate speech regulation. For, of course, consequentialist faces a number of objections. One might well contest that hate speech regulation really does lead to a reduction in harm. Relatedly, one might argue that whatever benefits might be accrued by hate speech regulation, these same benefits could be accrued through less invasive measures, for example changes to education. In other words, one might contest whether the benefit side of the cost-benefit calculation is quite as compelling as consequentialist makes out. Similarly, one might well suggest that the negatives associated with hate speech regulation are rather more severe than consequentialist makes out. In all, one might very well contest the argument for hate speech regulation that comes from consequentialist by arguing that consequentialist is false. But there's also a very different, though, compatible, way of contesting the argument for hate speech regulation that comes from consequentialist. This more deontic response points out that, even if one were to accept consequentialist, it does not automatically follow that hate speech regulation would be acceptable. In particular, if it turns out that hate speech regulation violates some core deontic value of ours, such as democracy or a prohibition against discrimination, then we should reject hate speech regulation even it does turn out to be approved by some cost-benefit analysis. The basic idea here is that our cordiantic values can be, at least sometimes taken as constraints on how we can act. Indeed, they often place constraints on even consequentialist maximizing actions. Here's an analogy. It might well be that rigging the next election will secure a great deal of good. Let's say that in terms of improvements to people's lives, it is by far the best action to perform. Nonetheless, most of us balk at the idea of even effective, consequentialist maximizing election rigging. That is because such election rigging violates some cordiantic value to do with democracy. This is where James Weinstein comes in. Amongst his many suggestions on the issue, Weinstein suggests that even the best kind of hate speech regulation that is effective and helps drive down harms against innocent citizens, 
might well violate some deep deontic value of our to do with viewpoint discrimination and political legitimacy. 5. The political legitimacy of governments, we are told, depends on their citizens being free to air their political view, including their grossly offensive views. Weinstein 2017 b. 750. As I will argue, Weinstein's worry with hate speech regulation turns out to be rather slippery. There are several subtly different ways of reading his argument. Some readings turn out to fall rather flat. Other readings establish only an objection to the very worst kind instances of hate speech regulation. As such, this essay argues that Weinstein's worries about hate speech regulation are misplaced. Still, inspired by some of Weinstein's suggestions about the issue of viewpoint discrimination, I present a new way of problematizing hate speech regulation. However, my way of problematizing hate speech, rather than calling for the abolishing of hate speech regulation, instead sheds light on the need for a certain kind of transparency and consistency in the way governments regulate harmful speech. My argument turns on the key point that commentators on the viewpoint discrimination issue have focused too narrowly on whether the government's justifications for their hate speech restrictions evince a kind of bias regarding certain views. While this is a good start, we would do well to also consider whether the way the government applies its justifications consistently that is to say, we need to look not simply at the government's justification for its hate speech regulations, but also at how this kind of justification coheres, or fails to cohere, with the justifications provided for other laws. I demonstrate this point through a discussion of the UK's approach to speech regulation. Inconsistency in a government's behaviour, it turns out, is not simply annoying in the way, for example, inconsistency in a friend or colleague is annoying, rather, Inconsistency in a government's behavior may well amount to a special kind of viewpoint discrimination that undermines our core democratic values, I political participation. To really understand Weinstein's worries about viewpoint discrimination, one needs to first take a step back and see that these worries are situated within a wider approach to democracy and free speech. Weinstein's account can essentially be boiled down into the following set of claims. The laws that governments enforce derive their legitimacy from the fact that citizens can engage in public discourse about those laws. Hate speech regulations illegitimately undermine the freedom of citizens to engage in public discourse about certain laws. Because of this, hate speech regulation undermines the legitimacy of several of our laws. Let's start our discussion with what Weinstein means by public discourse. Point six Weinstein casts a broad net. Public discourse, we are told, consists of speech on matters of public concern, or, largely without respect to its subject matter, of expression in settings dedicated or essential to democratic self-governance, such as books, magazines, films, the internet, or in public forums such as the Speaker's Corner of the Park Weinstein 2011 c. 493. Broad net notwithstanding, there are limitations on what counts as public discourse. Cases of speech that are directly harmful do not count as public discourse, or at least go beyond being mere public discourse. In this way, Weinstein should not be read as providing a defense of blackmail, threats, incitement to imminent violence, etc. By contrast, what Weinstein does seem to think citizens have a claim to, is being free to express their views concerning political and cultural matters such as the state of society immigration, the government, climate change, as well as more frivolous matters such as music, film, food, the best diets, beauty, and so on. Citizens should be free to engage in any kind of public discourse, so long as it does not lead to direct harm or imminent danger, meaning that citizens ought also to be free to engage in a good deal of hate speech. 7. Indeed, Weinstein argues that citizens should be free to express their views on these matters, even in highly abusive language Weinstein 2017 b. 776, when the government's regulation of speech constrains John from airing his views on the laws regarding where cars can and cannot be parked, Weinstein thinks that John is no longer under the same kind of obligation as his peers to obey the government's parking laws. That's a somewhat fun example, but Weinstein provides a rather more striking case for us to think about. Hate speech regulations constrain at least some citizens from airing their views on laws against discrimination. The thought is that at least some people need to be able to use hate speech, 
if they are to fully express their views on, for example, the apparent dangers of anti-discrimination laws. Our democratic values demand that citizens must have the chance to voice their dissent on the laws that constrain them. Hate speech regulation, then, can be framed as lying in deep conflict with our democratic values. Because of this, Weinstein agrees with Ronald Dawkins' suggestion that even the best kind of hate speech regulations leave us with something to regret about the government's actions. 8. A related question is whether, if Weinstein's rather deontic critique of hate speech regulation is successful, we might nonetheless end up having to do some consequentialist-style reasoning in a way. Imagine, for instance, that Weinstein is correct to suggest that hate speech regulation violates some core deontic value of ours to do with democracy, such that we have a powerful if not conclusive reason to reject such regulation. Imagine, also, that refraining from hate speech regulation, and thus allowing hateful attitudes to multiply in society, also violates some core deontic values of us. What should we do in this case? How should we adjudicate between these two threats to our deontic values? Perhaps we will end up having to do consequentialist reasoning to break the deadlock. All of this might motivate the idea that Weinstein's deontic critique of hate speech regulation doesn't amount to much in the end. But I think that would be a hasty conclusion. Even if we are drawn to the story sketched just above, this wouldn't undermine the importance of Weinstein's deontic contribution. First, this kind of story about deontic reasoning, leading to consequentialist reasoning in the case of hate speech regulation, requires vindication. It is premised on the idea that, I, hate speech regulation violates some core deontic value of ours, as well as that too, permitting hate speech will end up violating some deontic value of ours. I take it that Weinstein's work is valuable insofar as it explores I. Secondly, if hate speech regulation violates some deontic value of ours, it is morally stained in an interesting and powerful way. That stain is not scrubbed off by it being later justified as for example being necessary to avoid similar violations of our deontic values, as well as being justified by a tie-breaking consequentialist reasoning. If hate speech regulation can ultimately only be justified as a kind of lesser of two evils, or a necessary evil, it is still significant that it looks like some kind of evil, some kind of violation of one of our deontic values. So once again, Weinstein's deontic critique of hate speech regulation, if successful, turns out to be rather significant indeed. To the problem. Still, there's a lot about the argument sketch just above that may be criticized. In essence, Weinstein judges hate speech regulations to be a violation of our core democratic values, insofar as they exclude certain citizens from being able to take part in legitimacy lending public discussions. I want to raise two problems with this argument. The first problem serves to temper the force of this kind of objection to hate speech regulation, while the second objection exposes a crucial missing step in the objection. The first problem revolves around the substance versus style issue, that is part of many debates around speech regulation. Sometimes it is suggested that hate speech regulation does not in fact impose significant limits on the substance of what citizens can say. On the contrary, so the thought goes, hate speech regulation merely demands that citizens not express their hateful views in an overly vituperative and obscene manner. This still leaves citizens completely free to express their views in a more temperate manner. On this line of thinking, Hate speech regulation is not so problematic, and Weinstein is rather making a fuss over nothing. This line of thinking strikes me as overblown. It is overblown because hate speech regulation does in fact place restrictions on the substance of what citizens can say. For starters, when it comes to expression, sometimes style is substance. Take the expression fuck the draft, the focus of at least one important constitutional dispute, 9. In this case, the obscene language being used is part of the message that the speaker is trying to convey, forcing the speaker to couch their message in more moderate language. For instance, I object deeply to the draft, risks distorting their message. What if, for example, part of what the speaker is trying to communicate is that the time for civil discourse is over, and that obscenity is appropriate now since the government's actions are morally obscene? or perhaps the obscenity of the message really is communicating something distinctive that couldn't even be simply unpacked in the way I just suggested. Moreover, 
Hate speech laws often do in fact restrict at least some quite temperately couched cases of speech. Think of the speaker who implores his crowd, albeit in carefully worded temperate fashion, that a certain ethnic group poses an immediate threat to their safety, and then compares this group to animals that deserve to be culled. This kind of tirade may well count as dangerous hate speech, despite being absent of explicitly vituperative or obscene language. Of course, this will depend on how we define hate speech, but assuming that hate speech essentially involves inciting hostility against a vulnerable social group, it seems at least conceptually possible that this can be done in relatively plain prose. Still, I think there is a nugget of truth worth mining from this point about style and substance. That nugget is that the very basic propositional content of one's speech could probably be expressed, even while one is subject to speech regulation that outlaws vilifying vulnerable social groups, plausibly the best kind of hate speech laws, even if they impose some restrictions on what can be said, still leave citizens with a great latitude in terms of engaging in robust debate about the pros and cons of various laws. Granted, Hate speech regulations may prevent citizens from attempting to persuade others that innocent members of minority groups deserve to be killed. All the same, these limitations leave citizens with significant space to engage in serious critical discussions regarding whether a law should be passed, abolished, obeyed, is flawed, is ineffective, etc. Certainly, citizens can still express their basic dissent regarding any given law. Hate speech regulations leave citizens legally free to point out that they object to, for example, current immigration policies, sexual harassment laws, hiring equality laws, etc., even if these laws sometimes restrict citizens from fully expanding on the reasons for their dissent in a way that might promote violence against innocent people. Crucially then, if we frame Weinstein's viewpoint discrimination worry strictly in terms of ensuring that citizens can voice dissent to laws, it starts to look like his worries with hate speech regulation are overblown. Moving now to the second, and I think more significant, problem with the argument from Section I. Lots of uncontroversial laws impose some limit on the ability of citizens to participate in public discourse. For instance, incarcerating murderers imposes significant obstacles to their participating in public discourse. It is a lot harder to transmit your views to the wider public and listen to the views of others. When you spend most of your day in a cell, and it is impossible to do so if you are in solitary confinement. Similarly, legal restrictions on, for example, threats, breaking NDAs, violating copyright laws, sexual harassment, and stalking, all plausibly restrict the ability of citizens to express their views to those around them. Presumably none of us think these restrictions are a violation of our democratic values. But if some restrictions on public discourse may be permitted in a functioning democracy, why not count hate speech regulations among them? Presumably Weinstein's answer is that, and we will consider this in more detail below. Hate speech regulation doesn't merely limit the speech of citizens, but also does so in a way that is unfair or discriminatory or illegitimate. Perhaps, for instance, this is a matter of the government's justification being illegitimate. Or perhaps it is a matter of the kind of speech being limited. Still, the key point for now, at least, is that the mere fact that hate speech regulation limits the speech of citizens does not on its own establish that this regulation is objectionable. We need to add at least one additional ingredient to the mix if we are to arrive at a convincing objection against hate speech regulation. 3. The more promising reading, viewpoint discrimination. Let us move then to a more promising way of reading Weinstein one that promises to supply us with this missing ingredient that distinguishes hate speech regulation from, for example, restrictions on threats or the incarceration of criminals. Put simply, Weinstein thinks that hate speech regulations, unlike these other restrictions that might limit speech, penalize citizens for having the wrong kind of views. At several points he frames hate speech regulations as being viewpoint discriminatory. This concept of viewpoint discrimination, then, is supposed to function as the missing ingredient we have been looking for. One thought is that, as hate speech regulations often penalize vituperative and obscene expressions of antipathy towards the vulnerable group, while allowing more temperate and articulate expressions of antipathy, such regulations end up being discriminatory. In particular, they work against the common man and in favor of intelligent people, 
or at least it works in favor of those who are more skilled at artfully phrasing hateful ideas in ways that are less crude and epithet laden. In response to this worry, let me note that it isn't clear whether it is discriminatory, by itself, for a law to be such that some will have an easier time obeying it compared to others. If vituperative speech tends to be more dangerous than plain speech, then this provides us with a good reason to regulate the former while permitting the latter, even if this means that some will have an easier time than others abiding by such regulations. Indeed, all sorts of laws seem to function like this. It is pretty easy for those who don't drive cars to avoid breaking speeding laws. Moreover, even if we think that hate speech regulations involve some kind of unfairness or discrimination, because of the fact that some will find it easier than others to abide by those laws. It might be that such unfairness lies in the background social conditions or differencing levels of education, rather than the law itself. So let's look at a more promising way of cashing out the idea that hate speech regulation is, viewpoint, discriminatory. An obvious case of viewpoint discrimination might involve the government penalizing the expression of certain views merely on the basis that government ministers find those views to be offensive or distasteful. In such a case, the government doesn't merely restrict the ability of some of its citizens to express their views, and thus participate fully in political discourse. Rather it does so on the manifestly unfair basis that those views happen to conflict with the views of ministers. So, is there a reason to think that hate speech regulations in general are viewpoint discriminatory in this kind of way? Weinstein seems to think so. Consider his suggestion that what marks out hate speech regulation as viewpoint discriminatory is how the content of the regulation itself is such that it explicitly favors and protects certain views and arguments, while disfavoring and excluding others. At times he frames such regulation as inherently selective, by definition being in the business of choosing which ideas have a place in civilized society, and which ideas must be outlawed and removed. Unlike the ban on fighting words, or the other restrictions on harmful speech, hate speech bans are inherently viewpoint discriminatory. Britain's hate speech law, for instance, restricts only speech that intends to stir up racial hatred but not expression promoting racial tolerance. Weinstein 2017 A. 545, 2017 B. 750. Still, I want to consider two distinct worries with this more promising reading. The first worry is as follows. Weinstein, at least on the current way of reading him, claims that hate speech regulation is viewpoint discriminatory, yet on a closer look it is not the viewpoints of citizens that are being targeted. Weinstein suggests that what underwrites hate speech regulation that restricts, say, racist speech, is the government's own attitudes towards such speech. Of course, there are a few different things Weinstein might mean by this. He might be suggesting that it is the government minister's personal feelings of offense and distaste towards such speech that motivates their censorious interferences. But this is an ungenerous suggestion. Such regulations are at least ostensibly justified not by the government's feelings of offense and disgust, but rather by sensible concerns about the harms that this kind of speech may lead to. Harms that the government has a legitimate interest in preventing. So understood, it is the harmfulness of the viewpoints being expressed, rather than their content or the government's dislike of its content, that explains the government's regulatory response. Indeed, when it comes to hate speech regulation, the content of the speech being regulated arguably has no bearing at all on the government's motivations. One way of demonstrating this thought is to imagine that we are living in a world where hate speech never leads to any of the harms evoked in consequentialist. We can imagine, for instance, that, while some people engage in hate speech, audiences unanimously reject such speech as nonsense, or at any rate, audiences are never moved by this kind of speech to engage in discrimination or other kinds of harmful behavior. In this case, consequentialist would be plainly wrong and would not even provide pro tanto justification for hate speech regulation. This helps clarify the thought that, at least if consequentialist does indeed describe the dominant rationale for engaging in hate speech regulation, it is the harms associated with hate speech, rather than the content of the speech itself, that are being targeted by hate speech regulation. After all, once the harms are removed, so is the rationale for regulation. How might Weinstein respond to this point?
Well, one thought is that even if we concede that hate speech regulation only targets speech because it is harmful, nonetheless one cannot assess harm without knowing and judging that content. Indeed, to even apply a given hate speech regulation, judgments must be made about whether a given speech act counts as hate speech. Relatedly, note that when the government regulates hate speech for harm prevention reasons, it is attempting to prevent harms that are intimately tied up with the content of the racist speech in question. It is no coincidence that certain kinds of racist speech, unlike, say, egalitarian speech, are sometimes liable to promote hatred or otherwise led to harm. Indeed, it is precisely because of the content of racist speech, the dehumanization, the painting of vulnerable people as threats, etc., that listeners who have understood and accepted this speech might develop harmful attitudes or intentions. A comparison may help drive this point home. Imagine that each winter, a group of racists go for a relaxing log cabin retreat at the foot of a mountain. They go to share their hateful views, discuss their twisted theories, and to ideally persuade some of the locals about the alleged threat that certain races pose to social cohesion. Imagine also that the local government is reasonably worried that the noise made by these racists is likely to cause a deadly avalanche. As such, the government decides to restrict the racists from voicing their opinions. This form of government regulation is clearly not viewpoint discriminatory. Why not? Because the harms the government identifies as caused by the speech it is restricting are in an important sense independent of the content of that speech. By contrast, Hate speech regulations are a more complicated matter. They restrict speech out of a concern for harms that are intimately tied up with the content of that speech. So the question of whether such regulations amount to viewpoint discrimination requires more careful attention to answer. Even with all this said, I think we should still resist the suggestion that hate speech regulation is really viewpoint discriminatory. Granted, the harms that justify these regulatory responses are intimately connected with the content of the censored speech. But to put my skepticism plainly, the fact that two things are closely connected does not mean they are the same. Hate speech regulations involve the government classifying certain kinds of speech acts as particularly dangerous or harmful, or at least as particularly dangerous or harmful to vulnerable groups. These harms are closely connected to the content and character of these speech acts but they are still separate. Indeed, were these types of speech act less dangerous, then the government would probably not be drawing classificatory boundaries around them, much less designing specific regulations for them. 10. Moving on now to the second important problem with the more promising reading, even if we concede to Weinstein, arguendo, that hate speech regulation amounts to a form of viewpoint selection. It does not follow that this kind of viewpoint selection is therefore discriminatory. That is to say, even if hate speech regulation does pick out certain views as worthy of regulation, this needn't be unfair or morally arbitrary. The key idea that underwrites this version of the viewpoint discrimination worry that we are currently looking at is that viewpoint discrimination is unfair or morally irrelevant in some way. However, when we look at hate speech regulation, there is no immediate reason to think that it is any of these things. On the contrary, this kind of viewpoint selection may still be perfectly fair and stem from a morally relevant analysis of the fact that hate speech is more dangerous than other forms of similarly offensive speech. Essentially, I've suggested that discrimination involves more than merely selecting or distinguishing between cases. It requires some kind of unfairness or moral arbitrariness on top of that. Some might question how I am understanding discrimination here. On a different understand of discrimination, we discriminate when we say that blind people cannot be airline pilots. Such discrimination is justified, but it is discrimination all the same. Similarly, so the thought goes, Weinstein is correct to say that governments engaging in hate speech regulation are discriminating against hate speech and hate speakers, but I'm not convinced this is the best way of defending Weinstein. Note that if we do indeed construe discrimination in this way as potentially being justified and free from any unfairness, it no longer becomes clear whether there is any serious deontic violation involved in viewpoint discrimination. Overall, we can combine the points made above to form a two-pronged attack against Weinstein. On the one hand, it is unclear whether hate speech regulation is really viewpoint discriminatory in the way Weinstein suggests. That is to say, 
It's unclear whether it is really the viewpoints of citizens that are being targeted, or whether it is in fact the harms that follow from those viewpoints being expressed that are being targeted. On the other hand, even if we can see that in some relevant sense, it is the viewpoints of citizens that hate speech regulation targets, it is nonetheless unclear that this kind of regulation is unfair or discriminatory. The best kind of hate speech regulation plausibly targets hate speech as worthy of regulation on the grounds that hate speech is closely connected with serious harms. Such targeting, rooted in the value-neutral goal of harm prevention, is neither unfair nor discriminatory. IV. Analogies. I want to end my critique of Weinstein by talking about the intuitive appeal of his position, as well as one final way in which Weinstein has sought to defend his account. I have argued that hate speech regulation is not viewpoint discriminatory in the ways Weinstein has suggested, because such regulation may simply be based on a fair, non-discriminatory analysis of the harms involved. Still, maybe at this point Weinstein can dig in his heels. In particular, he might insist that even if the government has a good reason for picking out hate speech and targeting it for regulation, Nonetheless, there is something to regret about this whole affair. To help show the intuitive appeal of this position, Weinstein draws an analogy between hate speech regulation and a demonstrably outrageous case where the government disenfranchises those it fears will vote against a proposed bill. Weinstein hopes to show that, just as we find the government's actions in the voting case to be unfair or unjust, we should draw a similar conclusion about hate speech regulation. The voting case goes like this. The government has proposed a new bill that will increase property tax. The bill being passed is subject to it being voted for in a city council election. In order to ensure this happens, the government imposes onerous voting restrictions, for example age verification measures, that it knows will have the effect of mainly disenfranchising citizens who oppose the bill and would vote against it. Weinstein, 2017 B. 726. The case is supposed to elicit the intuition that, at the very least, the government's upstream disenfranchisement undermines the political legitimacy of the downstream tax bill. Weinstein even goes as far as to say that those who have been disenfranchised have no political obligation to obey the new tax law. What's more, we are invited to notice that this blow to political legitimacy is not scrubbed away by the fact that disenfranchisement might be necessary to secure certain benefits or even prevent the disastrous effects that would be brought about by the bills. Failing to pass, 11 finally, Weinstein suggests that just as we find the government's decision to exclude certain citizens from the democratic process to be utterly outrageous in this case, we should draw a similar conclusion regarding hate speech regulation. While this is an interesting case, it is doubtful what lessons we can draw from it seeing as how it is disanalogous to hate speech regulation. Three disanalogies in particular are worth highlighting. First, hate speech regulation amounts to a more piecemeal restriction compared to disenfranchisement. This is partly due to the difference between voicing an opinion on a law and voting on a law. If John is disenfranchised, he is completely excluded from voting and there is no other way in which he can directly impact upon the passing of the law. By contrast, if John is prevented from engaging in harmful hate speech, he is still able, as we saw earlier, to say a good deal about what he thinks about the law and generally voice his opinion. The second disanalogy concerns the harms in the two cases, whereas the underlying justification behind hate speech regulation is arguably the prevention of serious harms, the underlying justification in Weinstein's voting case is a little more nebulous. In the voting case, the government disenfranchises voters in order to ensure an effective property tax bill will be passed. Presumably we are to imagine that, should the bill not pass, people will be harmed as a result, but it is difficult to imagine how exactly this is meant to happen. Granted, we probably can imagine such a scenario, it is not beyond our imaginative capacities, but we should be wary about relying on our intuitions concerning under-described cases like this one Wilson, 2016, to remedy this issue, I will shortly offer a more precisely described case for us to reflect upon. Totally, the disenfranchisement case features deception on the part of the government. The government ostensibly introduces ID laws in order to prevent voting fraud. But what the government doesn't reveal is that their real motivation is to do with those who oppose the property tax being disenfranchised. By contrast, the best kind of hate speech regulation involves no such deception. With these worries in mind, 
Let me sketch a version of the voting case that is more analogous to hate speech regulation, so that we may test our intuitions. Once again, the government imposes voting restrictions. However, this time the government does not disenfranchise any citizens. Instead, it chooses to impose a series of piecemeal regulations designed to prevent serious harms from taking place. For instance, the government allows all citizens to vote in the council elections and ensures there are a number of council candidates that represent a wide range of views. However, candidates are banned from offering or supporting certain policies that are obviously dangerous or harmful. In particular, the government prevents councillors from offering discriminatory policies or policies that would legalize assault and battery. In effect, then, citizens are prevented from using their vote to support these policies. Finally, we are to imagine that the government is transparent and upfront about these piecemeal regulations and the reasoning behind them. This case is more analogous to hate speech regulation, but the problem for Weinstein is that the government's restrictive actions in this case also, I would venture, will strike many as perfectly acceptable. Indeed, arguably the USA already imposes these kinds of limits in the form of the Constitutional Bill of Rights. 12. Note here that we are conceding that, to some extent, these constitutional protections and hate speech regulations impose limits on the ability of citizens to have their say and participate in the democratic process. But the fair aim of preventing serious harms provides the requisite justification for these regulations seemingly without having a detrimental effect on political legitimacy. V a new viewpoint discrimination objection. In this closing section, I propose a novel, and I think more promising, way in which to understand the worry about viewpoint discrimination. I argue that while hate speech regulation needn't necessarily be viewpoint discriminatory in any way, Nonetheless, one might justifiably worry that a good deal of hate speech regulation involves what I will call bias in application. The key point here is that commentators on the viewpoint discrimination debate have focused too narrowly on whether the government's justifications even some kind of bias or favoring regarding certain views. While this is a good start, we would do well to also consider whether the way the government applies its justifications evinces some form of bias. When it comes to searching for discrimination in the government's regulation of speech, we need to look not only at the government's justifications for its speech regulations, but at how this kind of justification coheres, or fails to cohere, with the justifications provided for other laws. At several points in his work, Weinstein characterizes hate speech regulation as the product of a problematic form of ideology. Weinstein is clearly disdainful of the alleged ideological basis of hate speech regulation, suggesting that governments are acting on an agenda when they pick and choose which ideas are too dangerous to permit in society. This thought creeps up a lot in contemporary debates around free speech, with speech regulating governments often accused of possessing a liberal bias. Now, one obvious reply to this thought, which echoes what I have already argued, is to point out that the best kind of hate speech regulation simply reflects the fact that hate speech is more dangerous than most other forms of speech. Thus, the decision to pick out hate speech as especially deserving of regulation is not in fact the product of a biased liberal, or otherwise, but is rather the product of a neutral and principled commitment to reduce harms in society. Nonetheless, I think there is something to this talk of ideology and bias. Note that in order to defend hate speech regulation from the accusation of bias and ideology, I pointed out that said hate speech regulation may be engaged in for principled, non-biased reasons. In other words, the government's justification for engaging in hate speech regulation may be free from bias, but bias and justification is not the only way in which government decision-making may be biased. Another way in which bias can creep into government decision-making is if the government acts inconsistently on principled reasons. Call this bias in application. The government's justified regulation of hate speech is nonetheless biased in application if the government's regulation of hate speech is inconsistent with its wider approach to speech harms. In particular, there are at least two distinct ways in which hate speech regulation can be biased in application. First, the government may apply hate speech laws to some instances of speech that meet the description of hate speech, but not others. In other words, if the government is inconsistent in when it applies its hate speech statutes, the UK government has been accused of just the sort of bias in its hate speech regulation. 
The European Commission Against Racism and Intolerance, for instance, has found that hate speech regulations are not applied when media outlets engage in hate speech. The same report goes on to suggest that politicians have likewise been shielded from having hate speech regulations applied against them. 13. In this spirit, a philosopher like Weinstein may have a good reason to suggest that the UK's hate speech regulations have been applied in biased, ideological ways. The government, also it would seem, appears to have one standard for ordinary citizens, and another for media outlets and politicians. The second way in which bias in application might sneak into a government's hate speech regulation is if the government regulates hate speech because it meets some threshold or standard for unacceptably dangerous speech, yet opts against regulating other forms of similarly dangerous speech. Again, there is a good reason to suspect that the UK's regulation of hate speech has been biased in this way, as there are forms of speech that currently go unregulated in the UK, which would appear to be roughly as dangerous as, if not even more dangerous than, hate speech. For instance, what we might call anti-science speech, of which climate change denialism and vaccine misinformation are prime candidates, appears to pose significant dangers to the community. Conspiracy theories about the safety of vaccines can kill 14. Apathy about climate change that allows politicians to continue with the status quo may well turn out to be the most deadly attitude in our lifetimes. 15. Naturally, climate change denialism is a big business, and rich organizations have a vested interest in propagating arguments and studies that serve to delay responses to climate change. The problem is, delaying climate change action by even a few years will likely have catastrophic consequences. 16. Relatedly. Air pollution in the UK already kills tens of thousands of people a year. 17. With this in mind, political campaigns that allow for air pollution to continue, as well as arguments in favour of taking an apathetic approach towards tackling pollution, at least if they are effective, will have devastating consequences. The worry, then, is that the government's decision not to regulate these types of speech means that it effectively holds hate speakers to a different standard compared to those who engage in similarly dangerous though not hateful speech. If newspapers are permitted to publish influential think pieces that promote deadly agendas to do with ignoring the climate change disaster, why judge that your racist ill neighbor must be legally silenced from voicing her repugnant but manifestly less dangerous views about interracial marriage? Granted. There are differences between these types of dangerous speech and hate speech. Some readers may point to the causal connections between these different types of speech and the harms associated with them. Dawkin 1981. Other readers might claim that these other types of dangerous speech at least sometimes offer benefits, for instance, a chance to help engage in meaningful debate on a complicated scientific issue that hate speech does not. Others might dispute the claims made about the harms associated with the types of speech listed above. To be sure, there are subtle and complicated points to be made in this area, but I think the general worry about the bias in application remains. One way of drawing out this worry is that it is unclear what kind of standard actually underpins the UK's decision to single out hate speech as especially dangerous and therefore worthy of regulating, while permitting, for example, Dangerous climate change denialism. Is there some quantity or quality of harm that is guiding policy here? Without a clear threshold for what qualifies hate speech as especially worthy of regulation, it is difficult to fight the suspicion that other forms of harmful speech, like the ones mentioned just above, are being treated differently to hate speech without proper justification. Indeed, one may even suspect that it is the government's distaste for the gross content of hate speech, that explains its more punitive response. Drawing all of this together, even governments that engage in pro tanto justified hate speech regulation can nonetheless be guilty of what I have termed bias in application. That is to say, even if the government has legitimate cause for regulating hate speech, the government may be behaving in a biased manner given the way it treats other forms of dangerous speech. An analogy may serve to clarify matters the government is justified in having laws against embezzlement, but if the government only applies these laws against its political opponents, or for some reason prosecutes embezzlement yet not other forms of misappropriating funds, then it acts in an objectionably inconsistent manner. Note that in both the embezzlement case and the hate speech regulation case, 
The laws may well be simultaneously all things considered justified and objectionable. That is to say, the stain brought about by the government's biased regulation is not washed out altogether by the harm that this regulation prevents, although perhaps the harm prevented does ultimately justify the regulation. 6. Conclusion. As I have argued, generally the best way to respond to accusations that hate speech regulation amounts to a form of viewpoint discrimination is to consider how hate speech regulation can be framed as a value-neutral form of harm prevention. This serves, at least, to show that the government's justification for its hate speech regulation need not be viewpoint discriminatory, but even hate speech regulation that vaults this hurdle may still suffer from being biased in another way, if it turns out that the government's approach to harm and speech is inconsistent. In this case, it makes sense to think of the government's behavior as viewpoint discriminatory. My analysis of the way bias can creep into hate speech regulation falls short of establishing the kind of unconditional complaint against hate speech regulation that Weinstein seems to be arguing for. On my analysis, hate speech regulation is not doomed from the start to be viewpoint discriminatory. Instead, it all depends on whether the government's approach to hate speech is consistent with its wider approach to dangerous speech. Of course, this does not imply that hate speech regulation is therefore unproblematic or justified. Even if some hate speech regulation can dodge the viewpoint discrimination worry, it is an open case whether that regulation is objectionable for other reasons. I take it that there are many other potential worries with hate speech regulation, e.g. to do with whether governments will be competent in practice with carefully adjudicating between genuinely harmful cases of hateful speech and, relatively, Harmless cases of hateful speech, with whether governments can be trusted with this power, with whether roughly equally effective, but less coercive ways of addressing the harms of hate speech might be available, etc. Back to the issue of viewpoint discrimination, good governments should be duly anxious about the prospect of their hate speech regulation being biased in application. Ultimately, the best way for governments that regulate hate speech to combat this worry about bias is to be transparent regarding their reasons for regulating hate speech. Ideally, governments would make reference to the amount of harm, the type of harms, and the causal connections between harm and what is causing the harm that they consider necessary for a type of dangerous speech to be worthy of regulation. Once the government has outlined its standards for regulation, it can explain how it is that hate speech meets these standards, and why it thinks other kinds of dangerous speech that are not singled out for regulation fall short. Alternatively, the government might explain how other kinds of dangerous speech meet its standards for regulation, but how special features of that speech establish a case against regulation. Only when this kind of transparency is present, can we be confident that the government's treatment of hate speech is free from viewpoint discriminatory bias? Perhaps the most worrying of all cases, and this may well be the case we are confronted with today, is where the government has no concrete standards for regulation. Likewise, we should be worried about the case where the government has some standards for regulating harmful speech, but fails to communicate these standards to the public. Such cases do indeed leave us with something to regret.